And in this consciousness of pure delight, let me, <laughs> let me just welcome the shortest among the ministers, Reverend <laughs> But she's so full of joy and just bubbly all over her energy. <laughs> Welcome Reverend Sonia to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is my pleasure to be here, and I welcome you all to the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica, and of course, we include the World Wide Web. Now, before I start, I'm going to put on my distance spectacles so I can see you all and enjoy the look on your faces as I welcome you. And now I can put on my reading glasses. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, friends. Some time ago, I spoke at length about the virtue of patience. And in doing so, I emphasized the art and science of waiting for a demonstration of answered prayer to arrive. Some aspects of the talk did not go down too well with at least one member of the audience, who was quick to point out that waiting for a desired good to manifest was not a necessity. Our teaching, I was reminded, which is a science of mine, tells us so. True, true, that is without doubt what we believe. But I can also point out for those of you who use Amazon to order books, that there are two ways to get books. You can order the books and they can come by snail mail or you can get electronic ones which come immediately. It's the same books, you just one comes in a, through a different method. That is not to deny that what was said is really true. There is definitely no doubt that this is what we believe. In the mind of God there's no space, therefore there, there's no time, and therefore the answer to our prayers must be instantaneous. Why then does it appear sometimes that despite our best prayerful efforts, the answer to our prayers are being seen or felt much later than we expect? What is the answer? But first of all, a little revision. The science of mind teaches that there is one reality, God, the living spirit almighty, all power, all knowledge, present everywhere and active everywhere. We are points of expression of that God. We are waves in a sea of infinite potentiality. The universal living spirit being everything and everywhere is equally accessible to all. It expresses through us to the extent that we allow it. And we allow it through our use of the mind, our mind, which is our share of the one mind. It produces for us according to how we think and what we believe. It responds to us consistently and repeatedly in the same predictable manner corresponding to what our mental state is being. This is the nature of all known laws of nature and it is the nature of the law of mind. The law of mind takes our strongly held belief, our prayers, and acts upon them instantly at the moment it is received. The response is absolute, but the timing of the answer is conditional. First, let me say that all prayer is answered. Timing is divine timing, and maybe the time required for transformation to take place by the renewing of our minds. Sometimes we pray for things that we are not ready in consciousness to receive. But since all prayers answered and we persist and we believe, then we will become transformed by the renewing of our minds to get to a point where we deserve that thing for which we have prayed. On the other hand, the external conditions may be conducive to the goals we have set, may not yet be conducive to goals we have set, and we have to wait for them to change. Sometimes 
We want a building in an area where there's no building, and the building has to be built. Sometimes the goal we have set is supplanted by something better, which is more in keeping with our genuine desires. Because, you know, sometimes we ask for something, but we need that is what we really, really, really want. And I'm sure my daughter would, doesn't mind me sharing her story. At 17 years old, she, she had completed um, high school, and she was now looking around for um, where she could express herself by training in psychology. But there were nowhere in Jamaica that psychology was being taught. So she said, OK, meanwhile, I'll apply. She applied to UWI. She was accepted. She applied to um, UTEC. She was accepted. And then came a reply from Texas A&M offering her a scholarship. And she accepted, but there was a condition. They said she had to get her transcripts from her high school, St. Andrew High. And she tried and she tried everything to get those transcripts. Until this day, we don't know how the, why the transcript did not arise, arrive. But at the last minute when she saw that things were passing her by, she decided, she heard that there, was, um, there were scholarships to the USSR. And she, that is, the, who for those who are too young to know, Right? <laughs> it was the former Soviet Republic. And she found herself to where she could apply. And it took her just a matter of a couple of days, maybe about a week at the most. And she just joined a group of persons who were going to the USSR. It turned out that there they were, she was able to learn to, to enroll in psychology. Of course, when she went there, they didn't even know she was coming, and they were about to send her to the other end of it. And anybody who knows the USSR, USSR knows how far it is. So they're about to send her way across the place near to China. And the Jamaican says, no way. You're, no, you're staying with us. And she, she went to Kiev, which is in the Ukraine instead. So she started studying psychology, and then she decided, mm-mm. Yeah, but she persevered, and she was doing very well. And then her teacher said, look, you are doing too well for this. I think you should go into medicine. Now, my daughter hated the idea of medicine, because she didn't like the smell of the hospital. She didn't want to see blood, anything like that. But she said, OK, she would go ahead. And she, she went ahead. The truth is that she really, really, that is her calling. That was really her calling deep down but her idea of what medicine was like was not what it really was. And she's now a public health person, a leader in the public health field, far away from the hospital and far away from the blood. But she is, in fact, <laughs> doing all that she wanted. So you see, sometimes you have to trust that the law of mind knows what your deep desires are. And she loves it passionately and teaches it with equal vigor. So why is the manifestation of our desire an earnestly um, prayed for good, delayed? When Jesus himself said, fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12, verse 32. My observation tells me that in addition to what I have mentioned, that impatience is a major factor in the delay of the appearance of the answer to our prayers. Hence, I'm coming back again with the idea of waiting. We live in an age of the personal computer where every action and reaction seems to be moving at lightning speed. People have become accustomed to fast food, fast delivery, fast service, fast driving, and demand that, that even when it is not immediately necessary, right? The least amount of attention they want to make and the most casual intention, they expect they, they will carry out and expect to get the maximum and immediate results. The children who are being born now into this world are already programmed. Their DNAs are programmed for everything fast. Right. Often we are placing our attention on the passage of time 
rather than in the moment and in become distracted from savoring with delicious anticipation the delight and pleasure of experiencing and anticipating our intended goal. We can experience it before we get it, you know, just the anticipation. We become impatient and frustration sets in when our interpretation of the passage of time is delayed. I can remember how nice it was when, when we were preparing for Christmas and we enjoyed helping her mother to stir. I don't think that happens anymore. We can go to Mega Mart and buy cake. <laughs> but we're so stir. Sorry, Sandra. Yes, Sandra. Sandra does it. Maybe one of the few people, right? Yes. So we're stirring it and we know that at the end of it, we're going to get the spoon to lick, right? And then know. So we are enjoying the activity. And then you know, when it goes in the oven, oh my gosh, it seemed like eternity. But we're just smelling it, smells so nice, and we're enjoying the smell, it's so great, right? That is how we can save a life too, you know, right? When we have set up a goal, and we know what it feels like, how delicious, how everything is so great, enjoy the journey. Right? No. You know, sometimes I ask myself, why is it despite all some of the things that are happening to me? And many things do happen that I would have preferred not to happen. Why I still feel so joyful no matter what? And I have asked myself that question deeply. And I believe that the science of mind has taught me right, to have faith and trust in a law, which I know most execute what I want. So I am free. It gives me a sense of freedom and I can go about my business and don't watch part. You know, I just carry on, right? So, you know, there was a cardiologist once um, named Dr. Meyer Friedman, very astute cardiologist. He noticed that when he peeped out at his people in his very full waiting room, he would see them all sitting on the edges of the chair. And he noticed that the edges of the chair was worn out. And he kept wondering why. And then he said, you know, he peered out and he felt the behavior was once of tension and anxiety. Remember, as a cardiologist, you know, all of them coming because they're having heart problems, right? And he discovered that instead of sitting back in their seats and reading magazines like the other patients and conversing with each other like they do in my waiting room, right? <laughs> his patients were perched on the end of the seats like Olympic sprinters, so they could not lose an extra hundredth of a second when their names were called in to see the doctor. They were exhibiting, exhibiting the typical characteristic, he said, of the Horace syndrome. The Horace syndrome has nothing to do with moving quickly, you know. It is an unhelpful state of mind. Hurry tends to make us inefficient, unproductive, and discouraged, as well as irritable <laughs> and angry, and yes, even self-centered when we don't get our own way. It is a barrier to effective prayer. It's not the consciousness that is fertile for effective prayer. We need to learn to relax, even if we are aware of the clock ticking in front of us. Don't look at it. And there are deadlines ahead. Once you have set it up, everything just seems to fall into place. Reverend Anne, remember in our classes, it just happened. The tension in our bodies, the anxiety of our emotions, the obsessive racing of our minds are all futile attempts to solve problems which are either often imaginary, long past, or not yet present. It is said that 80% of our thoughts are spent on the future and or, or the past. Worrying about future events creates stress and anxiety and depression over things that have not yet happened and maybe will never happen except we are creating the parent thought for it right in that moment. Thinking about past events causes us to criticize, judge ourselves, or for how we handle certain situations in the past instead of letting them go, moving forward. Nowhere can man 
find a quieter or more untroubled retreat than in his own soul. A Roman soldier and Roman thinker called Marcus Aurelius said, I thought that was so smart of a soldier. Nowhere can man find a quieter or more untroubled retreat than in his own soul. And he continues, look deep within. Within is a fountain of good and it will ever bubble up if you will allow it. Why not just enjoy the practice and savor the inter anticipation, I said. Right? The value of spiritual practice is that it quiets the mind, is that it makes intuition more accessible. It forces us to be present in the present. And in that present, everything becomes clearer and the voice of God, which we call intuition, becomes more accessible. If you all want to learn how to meditate, because that helps you to remain in the present no matter where you are. If you want to practice the silence, we have prayer power. And if you want to learn how to vision, Reverend John, I'm putting him on the spot, will teach you visioning. That's not visualization. Visioning. You can come for a visioning class. It is absolutely wonderful, necessary, and useful. So that any situation you tackle, you have in front of you, the answer is there. You can learn to get to it. And whenever you find your mind troubled in any way, then you learn to quiet it and listen to the still small voice. So Reverend John, over to you. Throughout the day, innerly poise and become aware of what you are doing and feeling and thinking because it's easy to pray in the morning and the rest of the day a man just gone off like wild horses. So stop a moment, right? And say, hey, what's going on here? What's going on here? And remember that you are the I am, which is doing the work. And for me, I love to think of myself that I am a wave in a field of infinite possibilities. I am the wave, and guess what? I am in the process of becoming a tidal wave, right? So I just, not the kind that, that hurts people though. The tidal wave, a big wave that remains in the sea and just, ah, just relaxes. Mindfulness is a non-judgmental quality of mind which does not anticipate the future or reflect back on the past. So we practice it by just allowing ourselves quiet moments. It teaches us how to focus more on the present instead of on the future or the past. I, am, I love this statement, be still and know that I am God. And I love to play with it, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am, which is God, right? You can play with it too. Anyway, but it helps to bring you back deeply within yourself. Um, try these steps to help you throughout the week. Go to sleep with the sweetest thoughts you can muster. Sweetest thoughts. And I'm going to tell you leave the day behind because the day comes up in your sleep and your dreams, right? My husband was singing the other night in his sleep, but it wasn't singing, it was So I said, hey, what's happening? Oh, he said, I was dreaming that I was singing. All right, I said, please wake up and sing instead, right? So obviously he wasn't enjoying the singing, right? So go to bed with the sweetest thoughts. Reinterpret everything that happens in the day according to how you think it should be. Remember that God is present everywhere, even and equally. So even if you never like what happened during the day, God is present. So you say, reveal yourself to me, divine, or you just find a way to interpret it. It takes practice, you know. And if you keep doing it after a while, instantly, no matter what situation you find yourself in, even if it's a maca kind of joke, um, kind of situation for those on the World Wide Web, if it's a difficult situation, right, you will just, it will just come to you, the blessing in it. I promise you it will. So 
You know why it's important to do that? Because while you're sleeping, your nervous system is taking it up and making permanent neural networks as you sleep. There is something about sleep that's a gift. And it is set up to cleanse the body and to restructure the brain. But it also takes in what you put in it, whether you want it or not. And awake with the gratitude in your mind a miracle has just occurred. You went away and returned in full awareness. I don't even know where you went, actually. But you know, you were not there in consciousness. But through all of that, you came back. Then declare, before you even get out of your bed and say the meditation. You're going to do your meditation, and all that is a given. Declare a day of joy and fulfillment, and practice the art of surrender to the power and presence which make you, made you, to use you. So you say that everything that I do, say, feel, think, and experience, it is the power and presence of God that is doing it, saying it, feeling it through me. Everything, everything. And if you commit to that, you commit yourself also to a period of unconditional stillness right then and there. Call it meditation if you want, but stillness is important. And please do not do a little five minutes throw you over your shoulder kind of silence, right? 20 minutes is scientifically shown to be more than adequate. And then, having done this, let it be your intention to believe that you can achieve this state of inner stillness. Don't try to relax, you can't. It doesn't work that way. Commit to it, believe you can, and sit down and let your mind go anywhere. And stop trying to pull it back. It is not going to do. The more you force it, is the more it is going to be difficult to relax. Because what is happening? When you are becoming still, your mind goes all over the place, it's cleaning up. The nervous system is cleaning up itself. So some people say, oh, I can't meditate. My thoughts are all over here. I can't go blank. You're not supposed to go blank. When you go blank is when you die, right? So it is supposed to just be free and, and just let it be, right? If the thoughts come, yeah, OK, observe them. But then you'll find that gradually, outside of that silence, you will find yourself just feeling different just feeling more peaceful, more objective. The important thing is not what happens in that silence, you know, it's how the rest of your day goes. So just believe that it, you can achieve that silence and just be still and know that I am, which is God. And then make a list of what you spend your time doing and thinking during the day. A lot of our doing and thinking is quite unproductive, you know. And I'm not going to apologize for going on Facebook so often. I find it's very productive I, because I am doing God's work, right? OK, I'm not right, yes. But be careful that when you are there, you attract to yourself those persons after your own consciousness. And also, you can put in a word or two that might spread throughout the universe. It's very useful. But there are other things, you know, we find that we do that really not necessary. You get on the phone and you start talking about, uh, um, I know nobody in here does that, all the latest things in the news and all of that, but you can help your friends to avoid that, right? Somebody gave me a whole wad of, I needed some, I had a water spill in my house, and I realized, gosh, I don't have any newspapers. And somebody walked into my office. They were on their way to give away some newspapers. And I, and I said, thank you. And I have them in a garbage bag. And whenever I have any spill, I put it on the floor. Right? Some mop up the water. It can be very useful. You don't have to read it. Uh, <laughs> Re-examine <laughs> your priorities. <laughs> very useful. And I didn't have to buy them either. Re-examine your priorities. After you make a list and you say how you're using your mind, right? Re-examine your priorities. Make a list of the priorities in your life. And if how you're using your time doesn't match your priorities, right? What you need to do is to redefine them, OK? And joyfully and fulfillingly decide 
that if you do that, you will be successful in whatever you set out to do, because you have made your priorities, know your goals. And one of the things I ask you to do, having set up these goals, you do your treatment, right? You all can treat, I know, right? Where's my thing? So go into your, you have a treatment which done it so kind of last minute, agreed without hesitation to print for me. And I want us to read it together because it's an example of how having set up your goals and so on, you can actually continue along the path of, of just setting up your thing and expecting the best from them. So together, do we start first? I'll say rise above the doubt into a clear atmosphere of receptivity and agreement with the good you seek. That's from Ernest Holmes and I'm Bertha Smith. And then together, there is one harmonious life, the activity of God, the universal spirit, the essence of all things. My life is a center of activity within universal harmonious life, which is God. My desires, my expectations, my affairs reflect the divine order and precision. I accept them as evidence of the natural orderly progression and unfoldment of my good. I am on a persistent pathway of progress and evolution. I am therefore undeterred, undaunted by any appearance of delay, for nothing can sway my attention from my highest good. Nothing can delect me from my chosen path. I have complete faith in the power of God as me to bring about that which is I desire. I am hopeful, I am certain, I am certain of success, I acknowledge the presence of goodness as right action in all events of my life. Good and greater good is now appearing in timely sequence in my life. I have complete faith that orderly, harmonious power of God is always at work in my life. My good is assured. Peace and joyous expectation I release my words knowing that it is so, and so it is. Now, I share this with you because it is an example of a seven-step treatment. And you, when you take it home, you can number the steps yourself, right? There are space so that you can number it. And I included a step which I rarely ever um, introduce is denial, because denial only comes in, I made it a little stronger than I would not usually, because I'm writing it for this purpose, but denial only comes in if you start thinking that you're doubting yourself when you set up your prayer, right? If you see any little thing comes, just address it, and just, just, just box it away gently, not heavily like how this was done, but gently, right? Now, having remember that it is a good idea to introduce all your prayers with stillness first, right? Because that is the fertile mind that you are creating in order. You know, like how when a, a farmer gets some hard rock stone soil and you, 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 you mold it and dig it up first and then you wet it a little bit, right? You, you prepare the mind. So when the mind is prepared, it receives the thoughts and it got, guess also what happens. A prepared mind thinks rightly spontaneously. And when you think rightly spontaneously, guess what happens? You have spontaneous right action. And so your life becomes more orderly. And therefore, work on that. The most important gift that you could give yourself. Don't just rush off with some affirm, affirmations and some quick prayers and say, but I've been praying, but you might be praying, and praying in a mind that is filled with all kinds of, of stressors and contradictions and 
all kind of things that is unlike the nature of God. So you work at it because in the silence, it happens naturally. You don't have to go to a, a psychologist to go and dig up all of that stuff, you know. I always say this is the highest form of science I've ever been exposed to, and I have studied psychiatry and psychology. It is so simple that every time you hear it, you say, oh, I heard this before. Yes, you heard it before. Well, keep on practicing it. It's very simple, very simple. It means how where I put my mind, there where I put my attention, where I put my expectation, what I believe, that is what I see. But it is going to happen, you know, in the long run, but it will happen quicker if the mind is more fertile. If you have worked on that mind in stillness, if you have worked on that mind to cultivate love, to cultivate gratitude, and all the attributes of God, which are just ones which Jesus the Christ himself gave us a wonderful example of. When in raising Lazarus, he had to prepare himself, you know. Those who think he just got up and just went and he just born big, right? You know, people say he was born big. He was born big. He had to work on himself in that lifetime. So when Jesus was actually called to come and do this big, big raising of Lazarus, which I'm sure he expected, he had to work on himself. He had to make the mind fertile so that when he went to do the work, he could know with absolute faith, I know that you hear me always, God, you hear me always and you hear me now, right? I'm paraphrasing. And then what he could do, he had to bypass everything else, you know, because remember the crowds, which is all our mob sometimes tell us, no, it can't happen, it can't happen. Right? He had to bypass all of that. And guess what? What did Jesus say? Come, Lazarus, come forth, right? He never started to say, oh boy, I'm dead already, and you know the cells of your body are perfect, whole, and complete, and you know all the things that we say, we have to say to get to that stage. He knew that that within Lazarus was untouched by the appearance of stench or anything else. So he could see Lazarus come forth. Jesus told us that it is our duty and our responsibility and our dharma, our gift that has been given to us to be like him. Whatever things I do, we can do. Likewise, and even greater things can you do. And he also told us that the kingdom of heaven was within. So guess what? If you go and meet the king every day in the kingdom of heaven, right, gradually we'll get to a point, right? There is no difference between us and Jesus in terms of God's gift to us. Jesus worked on it, is that blasphemy? But it is the fact, as we come to Christmas and we exult, the, the example of Jesus Christ, know that we too also have that. We need to work at it. So let us, every available moment we have, enter into the kingdom to a commune and consult with the king. The king of glory is on duty 24-7. He is, or it, is always at home. Remember the promise of Isaiah when you feel like things taking too long. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Every time I say this, I feel almost like in tears because what a promise. What a promise. Be patient with yourself. Be kind to yourself. Enjoy the spiritual journey. Watch yourself be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And every day, in every way, as you carry out your spiritual practice, and mold and fertilize that mind that is a gift from God, and you use the gift of choice, to plant the seeds of joy and peace and harmony and prosperity and all the goodness that you desire. Watch and see how the law of mind takes it, molds it, creates out of it a pattern that is exactly in harmony with the joy and the peace you desire. Namaste. Wow.